ओके यू कैन गो अहेड मेक मेहिका वी आर लाइव सर थैंक यू आयुष सो गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन गुड इवनिंग सर माय नेम इज मेहिका सराफ एंड आई एम द होस्ट फॉर टुडे सेशन आई ऑन द बिहाफ ऑफ होल टीम ऑफ जस्ट कॉपिस वेलकम्स यू ऑल इन द इन ऑल इन टुडे सेशन on an appraisal of the supreme court verdict in bilkis bano so before we delve into today's session let me provide a brief introduction of just just corpus and the eminent guest speaker of the day mr harshit anand just corpus is an etic platform established in 2020 comprising a collection of legal professionals the platform aims to consolidate various aspects and chains of law under a single umbrella with an impressive reach averaging 600000 clicks per month on its website just corpus was inspired by the growing needs of law students as part of its initiatives just corpus has introduced an interdisciplinary journal known as the just corpus law journal now turning our attention to today's focal point we are privileged to have advocate harshit tanand as our esteemed guest speaker Advocate Harshit Anand is practicing at the Supreme Court of India. Sir has previously worked at Khetan and Company, Kolkata, and at Tri Legal Gurgaon in the year 2022 to 2023. He has represented Raghav Chadha in the matter of his suspension before the Supreme Court of India, and CPIM in the electoral bonds matter before the Supreme Court of India. Sir is an alumnus of Chanakya National Law University, Patna. Speaking of his few achievements, Sir represented and advised the Usha Martin Group on the acquisition of its steel business by the Tata Group, widely reported as Deal of the Year 2019. Sir has been an active mooter during his time in the law school, and uh, some of his achievements in the moot court competitions include the winner and best speaker at N J S S V Memorial National Moot. on constitutional law 2018 he was also the winner in the 5th rg annual national moot court competition in the year 2016 sir has also actively participated and took a keen interest when it comes to legal research and writing he was the student editor of cnlu law journal volume 5 to 7 till 2018 and he also contributed codes of india past to present a book published under the aegis of the supreme court of india by publications division government of india in 2016 sir has also varied experience in participating in parliamentary debates and meetings he won the best parliamentarian award at iit guwahati modern united nations conference 2016 and was also adjudged as the runners up at nusrl national parliamentary debate at nusrl ranchi 2016 Sir was also the student convener, academic and debating committee, CNLU Patna, two thousand seventeen to eighty. So, without further delay, I would like to hand over the floor to Sir for insights on the subject matter. Thank you, thank you, Mehika. Now, uh, without wasting much time, we'll move to the judgment. So, the judgment. uh i'm pretty sure everybody who's been following the news in the last one week or so is aware of this uh, verdict by the supreme court which has come in the uh, widely reported and the much talked about case of uh, bilkis yakub rasool um there are various aspects to the judgment but uh, just as a brief background so uh, this judgment was pronounced on 8th of january and was heard through the course of uh, 2023 and parts of 2022 and uh, basically the case uh, in a nutshell related to uh, quashing of the grant of remission uh, granted to 11 convicts who were uh, uh, con convicted and sentenced uh, to uh, uh, various uh, uh, con sentenced to life imprisonment for under various sections of the ipc for uh, crimes committed against the lady in question which is bilkis banu and her family during the 2002 gujarat riots now um because there are various aspects to the question we'll mostly deal with what were the issues that the court dealt with 
and on what grounds has the court decided to quash the uh, order of remission issued by the government of Gujarat. Um, so the way the proceedings went was the first uh, issue in the case in the case was the issue of maintainability of the petitions and uh, the first and the lead petition was filed by the victim herself um, which was Bilkis Yaqub Rasul and there were accompanying petitions also because because this case was a very a case, this was a case in which a very heinous crime was committed not only against the victim but also against the family of the victims the small kids and other members of the family so other members of the society the civil society and members uh, from uh, active act activists as well as some politicians also filed um, pils before the supreme court so as to oppose the remission which was granted by the state of Gujarat to these 11 convicts. Now, the first issue which was decided and also argued uh, before the court was with respect to the maintainability of the petitions. Now, the, the maintainability part has two aspects. Of course, uh, one is regarding the maintainability of the petitioner herself and uh, the petitioner as in the victim herself. Uh, and the other aspect of maintainability is with respect to uh, the maintainability of uh, the other PILs, the public interest litigations which were filed opposing the order of remission. Now, it was argued by the, by, by the respondents, uh, by the state basically, that uh, number one, the petitioner should have approached the High Court of Gujarat under Article 226 of the Constitution before uh, availing her remedy under Article 32. And uh, this is not a very, uh, this is not a very material aspect of the judgment, but this is one aspect which probably will not be talked about a lot because this is a jurisdictional issue, a question of maintainability, but it is important nonetheless as to how the court finds the petition maintainable or why it finds it maintainable. Because ordinarily, uh, in ordinary course, it would be, uh, in line with, say, uh, the hierarchy that the hierarchy of uh, uh, judicial adjudication, which the constitution provides, it, it would be ordinarily advisable to approach the high court first, because the high court also has powers, writ powers to quash certain government actions, if those are not found to be in line with the law of the land or the constitution. And then <laughs> in case the state or say the private party is aggrieved by the order of uh, uh, say uh, the high court, then under article 32 or under the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court can be approached. But in this case, uh, Supreme Court was directly approached by the petitioner. So the question of uh, the propriety of whether the Supreme Court should have been approached directly also arose. Now, uh, the Supreme Court answers this, the question of the maintainability of the lead petition, that is the petition of the victim herself, in two ways. It says that, uh, of course, under Article 32, anybody can file their uh, rate petition for enforcement of their fundamental rights. What it also says, and which is an important part of the maintainability uh, decision, is that uh, while Article 32 petition can be filed for enforcement of fundamental rights. The ambit of Article 32 would also include uh, the principles which are uh, enshrined in the preamble to the Constitution. Now, preamble to the Constitution uh, encompasses the principles of justice, liberty, fraternity. And the court says that the meaning the, the, the expanse of the term justice as included in the preamble has to be wide. It has to be given a wide meaning. So if the petitioner herself has approached the court under Article 32, because she's aggrieved by this order of remission and she thinks that somehow she has uh, justice has not been met to her in the real sense of the term, then, under, then an Article 32 petition would ordinarily be maintainable. But other than this, which is 
more of a theoretical justification uh, uh, a justification rooted in the meaning of article 32 and the import of article 32 the court also gives a very practical case related aspect a uh, case related justification for entertaining this petition and to understand that we will also have to delve a little uh, into the background of the case so the way this case proceeded is uh, initially when uh, the FIR, the first FIR was filed. So after the first FIR was filed, uh, the case was closed because the FIR was filed against uh, uh, undisclosed assailants or, or unidentified assailants rather. And uh, it was found that uh, the, the police basically could not find who, who were the responsible uh, perpetrators of the crime and therefore the case was closed but the case was reopened again by an order of the supreme court and uh, because the petitioner was uh, because, because the victim was apprehensive that she would not get a fair trial in the state of gujarat so by a transfer petition the case was transferred to the state of maharashtra the sessions uh, court uh, trial that is and the matter was tried in the state of Maharashtra, <coughs> where inter alia all of these uh, convicts were tried and they were sentenced and uh, found to be guilty. Now, thereafter, the matter was, of course, appealed to the High Court and the High Court upheld the conviction and the Supreme Court upheld the conviction. Now, after the period of, uh, once the period of life imprisonment, which was given to all of the convicts, once it commenced, so after serving the sentence for around 14, 10, 14 years, the perpetrators of the crime, or rather the convicts, they started applying for the remission of their uh, uh, sentence period. And the power of remission, of course, is a constitutional power, which comes from, which, which is given to the, uh, uh, which is given to certain constitutional uh, functionaries. But it also is a function of certain provisions under the Code of Civil uh, Code of Criminal Procedure, and under certain provisions of the Code of Criminal Procedure, it is the appropriate government who has the power to uh, grant remission or a commute of sentence, reduction of sentence. These powers are there in CRPC also. Now. Uh, so from time to time, different convicts, some of them together, some of them separately, they were applying for remission. And the way remission happens is recommendations play a very important part in remission. And when I say recommendations, it is recommendation by the jail authority, recommendations by superintendent of the police, recommendations by the presiding judge who uh, was involved with the trial and did the conviction and the sentencing in the first place. So... This process was going on and there were mostly rejections though, because most of these functionaries were of the idea that because the crime in question was so heinous, uh, uh, an order of remission would not be fit, which in itself is not a very correct understanding or a correct, uh, I would say, purpose of the power of remission. But we would come to that later. But all in all, it was mostly a negative recommendation that came from most of these uh, most most of these uh, statutory functionaries and on that account uh, remission was being rejected or remission was not being granted to most of the uh, most of these convicts now while this process was on a writ petition was filed in the supreme court and of course the bombay high court was also approached and the stance of the government of Gujarat all this while was pretty consistent where they said that we would not be the appropriate government in this case because the case was tried in the state of Maharashtra. And uh, as per CRPC, it is the state of Maharashtra which would be the appropriate government. Hence, uh, we are not competent to pass this order of remission. We would not be the appropriate government as per the provisions of CRPC. Now, while all of this was happening, a writ petition was filed in the Supreme Court. In 2022, an order of the Supreme Court came 
uh, which said that it would be the state of Gujarat, which would uh, be the appropriate government as far as this matter is concerned. And it also observed, or I would say directed the state of government to consider the uh, the case of remission of these 11 convicts as per their 1992 uh remission policy in the state of Gujarat. Now, one of the main issues before the court, like I said, was the issue of jurisdiction. Now, coming to the second, the first aspect, if you uh, like we had discussed, was the theoretical aspect under which court said that Article 32 had uh, wide expanse and therefore the, the, the petitioner had locus to approach the Supreme Court directly. The second practical aspect which I was talking about was that the court said that it was one of the pleas of the petitioner that the order of uh, 2022 obtained from the SC in which it held that uh, the state of Gujarat was the appropriate government was an order which was obtained by suppressing relevant evidence. And uh, a lot of important facts had not been placed before the Supreme Court. For example, it wasn't placed, the Supreme Court wasn't apprised of the fact that the 1992 remission policy under which the convicts claimed remission itself had been cancelled. It did not exist anymore. The second important thing was that the government of Gujarat had itself argued in the proceedings that it was not the appropriate government under the provisions of the CRPC. However, the contradiction in the case <coughs> is that once the 2022 order came out, the Gujarat government moved immediately to grant remission when it would have been consistent with their arguments to file a review petition to the 2022 SC order challenging the correctness of the order. Now, the Supreme Court says on the issue of maintainability that because all of this machination was done purportedly in pursuance of an order of the Supreme Court, had the petitioner moved the High Court, the High Court may not have found it appropriate to interfere with the remission order in view of the correctness or rather say the doubt or, or, or say the cloud around the 2022 Supreme Court order. So citing this reason, the Supreme Court says that it was only appropriate for a bench of the Supreme Court to not only assail the remission order, but also the correctness and the circumstances in which the 2022 Supreme Court order was given so as to uh, determine whether remission should have been granted or not. Now, citing this, citing these two reasons, first is the theoretical aspect under Article 32 and Article 32 would also include the ideals of the preamble, which includes the concept of justice and what it actually means. And this pr practical aspect where the court says that in view of the 2022 Supreme Court order, the High Court may not have uh, deemed fit to interfere with the remission order. So on these two grounds, the lead petition was found to be maintainable. Now, the other related question on maintainability, which was before the Supreme Court, was whether the other PILs, which were supporting the cause of the petitioner, basically saying that the remission order is not valid, and uh, uh, therefore these uh, convicts who had committed this heinous crime should be sent back to jail. It was regarding the validity of those questions and arguments which came from the side of the state, from the side of the respondents was that because this remission case is between the convict and the court and the victim, because once you're deciding a question of remission, two sets of rights have to be balanced. And this is where we also need to discuss what is the rationale behind this concept of remission. So the concept of remission is something which takes its roots not only in, say, reformative justice, concept of reformative or school of reformative justice, but also in other schools such as, say, uh, the, the, the theory of deterrence, deterrent justice. 
because what is believed in criminal theory is that nobody should be an outlier to the society everybody should be given a chance if somebody has served long years of sentence and has shown consistent good behavior and it is deemed fit by the respective authorities the competent authorities that this person can be put back into the society and can be reintegrated in the society and can contribute to the society or just can live his life can enjoy his liberty can enjoy their liberty then they should be set free on certain parameters being met on certain yardsticks certain boxes being ticked they should be left back to the society and they should be they should be allowed to live their lives allowed to join mainstream society and should basically be given a second chance this is the concept the the long and short of why remission forms a part of our criminal jurisprudence now the argument which came from the respondents was it because while deciding remission two sets of rights have to be balanced one is a right of the convict which is his right to liberty which is his right to join mainstream life join uh, uh the normal functionings of life so to speak again and uh, lead say a changed life or, or or enjoy a second chance versus the right of the victim who has of course been wronged and there's no question of whether or not she has been wronged because remission always happens after conviction and sentencing so the guilt or the crime has already been established there is no question of the guilt the the crime not uh, uh, having happened the crime not being not, not, not the, the doubtness of the correct of the crime having happened so on one hand you have the right of the convict to be launched back in the society on the other, on the other hand you have the right of the victim and the right or the right of the victim's family in case the victim is not alive to get complete justice to get meaningful justice in other cases there may be or even in this case there may be questions or apprehensions regarding the safety of the victim or the victim's family because the the crime in question at least in this case was a very heinous crime so if you go through the judgments the very first few pages of the judgment the first four five pages of judge of the judgment you will find the very gory details of what exactly happened in this case so in crimes such as these you also have to keep in mind that if the perpetrators the convicts were to be set free then would it have any adverse effect on the safety of the victim on the safe, safety of the lives of the victim and the victim's family would it have any adverse impact or would risk their or would it risk their safety their, their their freedom their liberty to enjoy life or go out basically in any manner so all of these things have to be balanced and all of, all of these things have to be considered by the appropriate government and then by the court if the court thinks that the appropriate government has not exercised its jurisdiction correctly so this was the argument which came from the respondent side now what the court does here is the court does not answer this question the court leaves this question open for the reason is that they say that in view of the lead petitioner's petition already having admitted already being admitted in court for this matter the question of locus or the question of admissibility of the other petitions basically becomes an acad academic exercise so the court does not go into that question the court does not answer its uh, the validity or rather the maintainability of these petitions it chooses to decide solely on the basis of facts and the averments of the lead petition which is the victim's petition now coming to the merits of the judgment the main part of the judgment uh we can broadly say that the judgment has been rendered on three broad grounds on three main grounds each of which more or less have to do with <coughs> say violation of certain procedural safeguards and when i say procedural safeguards i mean i also mean provisions of the crpc the code of criminal procedure 1973 so the first and the foremost ground or rather the main ground one of the main grounds on which the judgment turns is 
that the Supreme Court holds in this in this matter, that under the provisions of the Code of Criminal Procedure, it is only the appropriate government. And when I say appropriate government, it means the government of the state where the convict has been tried and sentenced. And if you were to actually look for this definition, you can refer to Section 432 of the CRPC 1973, which deals with the power to suspend or remit sentences. And when you go to Section 430, 432, Subsection 7, here you will find the definition of appropriate government. So it says in this section, which means Section 432, and in Section 433, the expression appropriate government Part A is not relevant for us. Part B says, in other cases, the government of the state within which the offender is sentenced or the said order is passed. So, section 432, subsection 7, clause B makes it pretty clear as to what is the meaning of appropriate government. Now, go back to the facts of the case which I uh, narrated a little earlier, where I told you that when the original trial was happening, because the petitioner in this case, the victim, was apprehensive that she would not get fair justice or a fair trial in the state of Gujarat, she had filed a transfer petition. The transfer petition had been allowed in the peculiar facts and circumstances of the case. And then the matter had been sent to the state of Maharashtra for trial. So now it is the state of Maharashtra where the matter was heard, the trial was conducted and the conviction was held and the sentencing was done. So it is very clear from the definition as to what would be the meaning of appropriate government. So it would not be the state of Gujarat, but the state of Maharashtra, which was the appropriate government to pass this order of remission. So the first ground on the major ground is that the Gujarat government, therefore, had no jurisdiction to pass this order. Again, a very technical, a very technical ground, a ground which uh, 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 does not actually merit going into the, the details of the crime or the heinousness of the crime. There is no cause or there is no reason to go into the heinousness of the crime because if there is no jurisdiction to pass the order there is no there is no ground made out there one but the court does not even have to discuss the merits the the, the meat of the case even on, even on the ground of jurisdiction the matter could not have uh, been dealt with by the, dealt with by the state of gujarat now the second ground is the more serious ground in terms of how the case actually transpired. So in the second ground, the court notes that, like I told you a few minutes earlier, that the government of Gujarat had acted purportedly in pursuance of a 2002 Supreme Court order, which had held that the Gujarat government, the, or the Gujarat state rather, was the appropriate government. So the court says here, that this order had been obtained on the basis of fraud and suppression of evidence. Especially in light of the fact that it was the government of Gujarat which had itself argued before the Supreme Court in those relevant proceedings that it was not the appropriate government. The appropriate government was the state of Maharashtra because the matter was tried, the convicts were, sent, were, were convicted and sentenced in the state of Maharashtra. However, what happened was that once the 2022 order came out, the Gujarat government, like I told you, moved swiftly to grant remission when the correct course of action would have been to file a review petition against the Supreme Court order because it was perpetually, it was quite clearly not in accordance with the provisions of law. So this, this exercise was dealt with very strictly by the court in this case. And the court came down heavily on the state of Gujarat and also on the convict. And it said that because fraud, the, 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 the 
concept of fraud or whenever fraud creeps into anything any any legal proceeding it may be adversarial it may be transactional fraud vitiates everything so once fraud enters the element of fraudulent behavior enters in, in any proceeding any any say trial any kind of evidence leading evidence suppression that that element vitiates everything the entire proceedings are tainted and nothing so to speak remains sacred about that those those set of proceedings so citing this the court says that this exercise of granting the remission order was actually uh, a power encroachment exercise an encroachment of power by the government of gujarat which it was not entitled to do which it was very clearly not entitled to, entitled to do and the government of gujarat was very clearly aware of it because the arguments that they make before the supreme court in the relevant proceedings was completely opposite to what they went ahead and did after the order and the court also notes that this might have been a misconstruction of the order because what the order the order nowhere says that a remission has to be granted even if the order were to be considered correct in law it nowhere says that the that the remission has to be granted in the facts and circumstances of the case please grant remission what it simply says is that the appropriate government is the government of gujarat and the government of gujarat has to consider the case of remission of these convicts but the order may have been misconstrued by the government of gujarat and they may have thought it as a mandate of the supreme court to grant remission expedition expeditiously now the third ground and an important again an important safeguard for remission like i said is the requirement of the opinion of the presiding judge of the original court which is responsible for conviction and sentencing so what usually happens is that the government the appropriate government the concerned government may refer the matter back to the presiding judge if suppose their original opinion is not clear or the government is of the opinion that the that the uh, opinion of the presiding judge is uh, unreasoned or not sufficiently reasoned then it is incumbent upon the government to send it back to the presiding officer now what cannot happen what is what is barred under law is that the government cannot substitute the determination of the judge by its own reasoning and this has a very fair background or a context subtext to it because the presiding judge is the judge who is most well aware of the matter he or she they are the one who are sitting throughout the trial who before whom all the evidence has been led the examination the cross examination has happened the basically the whole matter has been unearthed unearthed and uh, discussed in bare detail before that judge so they should be in the best position to determine whether the concerned con convict or the concerned convict convicts deserve remission or not deserve a commutation of sentence or not but what happens in this case is that the presiding judge which was the judge in maharashtra so they had issued an opinion rejecting the remission however when subsequently the gujarat government assumed the power unto itself to grant remission it proceeded to ignore that opinion so there is illegality on two levels the first illegality is assumption of power which did not belong to the government of gujarat in the first place the second illegality is a complete disregard for the judgment or the opinion rather of the presiding judge and this the court says is another reason why the remission order is illegal now i'll deal with so this is the long and short of the judgment as far as the judgment is concerned and like i said the court also comes down heavily on the on the conduct of the state of gujarat which is also very questionable in this case because the court says that from the conduct of the state of gujarat once the supreme court order was given is that it started acting in tandem with the convicts as if it was furthering the cause of 
release of the convicts when what it should have done was to follow the principles of remission so as to see objectively even if it were to have the power even if it were to have the power even even if we were to think for a second that it were the appropriate government it did not follow objectively any of the principles of remission legally uh, either under the crpc or which is conventionally followed so citing this the court says that while granting remission while remission has a very noble objective it has the objective of rehabilitating a criminal rehabilitating a proven convict and like i said re reintegrate them back into the society give them a second chance to lead a life but this cannot be done remission cannot be done in the teeth of the law and it's a very uh, it's a very important principle of common law jurisdictions across the world across jurisdictions in india in the us in canada south africa wherever common law is followed is that one can claim equity one can claim mercy from the law in view of the facts and circumstances or whatever hardship and due or due hardship that they are going through but such equity can never come at the expense of a written provision of law at the expense of a convention which has ingrained itself into the letter of the law which has exactly which is exactly what has happened in this case the court says that even if they were to even if the court were to consider the aspect of liberty or the aspect of rehabilitation of say the the convicts in this case even in that case the court will still have to abide by the rule of law and the rule of law would dictate that the remission granted in the first place the the remission itself was valid and not illegal so a determination of equity a determination in equity cannot come at the expense of a provision of law like i said it cannot be against the law of the land <clears throat> and citing this reason and also the principle that one has to come to the court with clean hands which is again a very important principle of common law one cannot suppress material one cannot be fraudulent in their behavior before the court one has to disclose all the facts even if the facts are seemingly against you it is the duty of the convict and the convict's uh, representatives before the court to disclose all material disclose all factual background before the court and if something has been done into something has been done actively to suppress that material for example in this case like i told you the 1992 remission policy had already been cancelled it wasn't in existence anymore but the court goes on to say that the case the case of the convicts have to be considered as for the 1992 remission policy so this goes on to show that the court was misled deliberately and once you mislead the court deliberately you lose your entitlement to any kind of equitable relief or any kind of favorable judgment from the court in view of equity in view of justice or fairness so these are broadly the reasons as to why the court says that the remission in this case in this particular case was not valid and thus ordered that the convicts be sent back to prison the court had of course given a time of 2 weeks and uh, very recently again in view of the order some extension was uh, prayed for by the convicts which has again been rejected by the same bench in the supreme court now i'll uh, wrap this up by uh, making another important uh, uh, observation on the judgment which is of course a very important Uh, aspect of the judgment from a point of view of the law of remission itself from a point of view of how this judgment will affect future convicts or future cases of remission which might be bona fide cases which might be cases of where say remission has been granted very legal has been uh, granted in accordance with the procedure of law not how it was done in this particular case so how exactly should a law of remission work and this is where the judgment becomes important the judgment is important because number 1 it walks the talk it does not simply 
wax eloquent on how the thing was illegal but then also goes on to re uh, goes on to correct the wrong it go, goes on to send the convicts back to the prison who were very clearly wrongly and illegally uh, uh, set free by the remission order so the court does not stop short of actually implementing its reasoning it goes ahead and does implement the reasoning by doing this balancing which i told you it said that yes remission is an important law remission is an important part of our criminal jurisprudence but it cannot come in the teeth of the law and hence in this case the remission order has to be quashed now, the second thing that the court does is actually an act of omission on the part of the court which is actually a good thing for future cases and which was one of the apprehensions that a lot of lawyers a lot of legal experts had in view of the case is that because of course the case in question involved very gruesome act of murder act of gang rape and uh, uh, the court could very well have made say sweeping remarks and suggestions in view of these factual aspects of the case by saying that say the convicts of such cases should never be entitled to remission the cases should not be considered but the court has not done that and that in view of liberty principles of liberty in view of how exactly the constitution wants our criminal law to work is a welcome thing because the law of remission does not turn on the heinousness of the crime the heinousness of the crime while it is an important aspect it should not the law should not say that convicts who are serving their sentence for a gruesome act of crime for heinous murders or heinous crimes in general should never be entitled to remission because remission is not simply based on what crime one committed remission is also based on what has been the the exact journey of reformation of that particular convict in whatever number of years that they have served in the prison what has the convict done how has the convict behaved what does the appropriate authority what does the competent authority think of the convict in view of how they have behaved post the conviction after they have started serving their sentencing that's the sentence that is a very important factor in determining cases of remission so one cannot say that because one convict has been convicted and sentenced for a very gruesome act for a very heinous uh, crime they should never be entitled to remission and this was an apprehension that because in the peculiar facts and circumstances something very gruesome has happened the victim has suffered in ways which are inhumane so the court could have very well gone ahead and made those observations in light of the case but the court does not do that the court does not dilute in other words the court does not dilute the power of remission in any manner it does not limit the powers of the appropriate government it only delivers its judgment in the peculiar facts and circumstances of the case while also maintaining that the power of remission is a very very important part of our jurisprudence and has been put there for a particular reason with a particular noble objective so with this order or with this judgment the court simply restricts itself to dealing with the facts and circumstances of this particular case while not limiting the power or while not disturbing the jurisprudence around remission in any manner which can probably prejudice any say bona fide convict in the future who may have uh, through his conduct established a case of remission even in case of a heinous crime and probably could have been entitled to it so their cases would not be adversely affected by this particular order so that is a very important apart from whatever uh, it does for the victim in question that is a very important contribution of this judgment so i think this is the long and short of it we have it's it's 5:50 so i think we have around 10 minutes before we conclude the session so if there are any questions any clarifications anything that come your way please let me know then i'll try and answer it in the next 5 minutes or so 
Yes, thank you, sir, for sharing a valuable insight. So I would like to put forth a few questions collected by uh, from our participants. The first question is, does the state government have the power to grant remission? So like I said, it is the appropriate government which has power to grant uh, remission. So you can always go through whoever this question has come from. They can go to section 432 of CRPC. And they will see the definition of the appropriate government. So it is the appropriate government, like I mentioned, which has the power to grant remission. And do you think these cases, uh, why do you think these cases take many years to be decided? Shouldn't the laws be more stringent is the question. See, I think this case was decided in a reasonably good time. The remission, see, you have to understand the power of remission actually lies with the government. We have this tendency of thinking that it is only the courts that do justice, but that is not entirely correct. The power of remission is an ex it lies in the domain of the executive. It is the jail authorities, of course, in tandem with, with the concurrence and the opinion of the presiding judge. The, it is the executive which has to make that decision. The courts have to exercise judicial review and interfere only if they think that this power of remission, like in this case, was not exercised correctly. So the first aspect is this is an executive decision. Remission is an executive decision. The second aspect is, as far as this case was concerned, I think it was conducted and heard and then judgment was delivered in uh, within reasonable time because, our, because these cases and involve a lot of uh, deliberation on important factual events. We, we of course hanker for quick, effective, speedy justice, but we also have to keep in mind that justice cannot come, timely justice cannot come at the, at, at the cost of material justice. And for material justice, the court will always need time for deliberation. For example, this case required deliberation over a lot of factual events. How, what is the chain chronology of events which has transpired, the evidence on record, whatever. This is only one case in question. So while it is a valid complaint, our judicial system is uh, slow in view of a lot of factors. But essentially, this remains in the domain of the executive. The court will only exercise limited jurisdiction, limited review, uh, once it only when it finds that permission was not granted properly. Yeah. All right, sir. And uh, what do you think, according to you, the liability would arise if they were convicted according to the new criminal bills? New, so criminal, the new criminal, criminal The new criminal procedure code, what uh, the the new acts are yet to be notified, so they're not in action. They're, they're not uh, they're not in application as we speak. But I am sure there must be corresponding provisions in the new act also in the new Sanghita also, and. Uh, Whatever would have been the recourse under that law, ideally that should have been followed. But it's all conjectures and surmises at this point of time because the law is not in operation. We are still abide. We are still going by whatever the law is right now. Yes, sir. And do you think our pardoning power is misused by the government in power? So see, because things like remission, like I said, always lie in the domain of the executive. So there is always a say an apprehension of say the issue of political expediency uh, tampering with the objective judgment of the state, the government that is. So that is one risk that cannot be avoided. In my opinion, that is one risk that will always run in these matters. And that is why there are certain procedural safeguards within the law. For example, like I said, the opinion of the presiding judge which is not technically a part of the government, who is not technically a part of the government. So while, of course, these matters will always have a political tenor, a political color, because, of course, governments are run and function for political purposes in view of political gains or whatever. So that judgment, that, that risk will always be there. But yeah, there are in implicit guidelines, implicit checks within the law, which do provide some sort of say safeguard or some sort of restraint against these these decisions being political. And uh, the next question is: If premature release of convicted person is wrong, then why not High Court or Supreme Court takes home or to cognizance? 
and uh, sir so please yes. shed light on whether there is exists a provision related to uh, this that empower the courts to take so much cognizance in this matter see our constitutional courts which is the high court and the supreme court <laughs> can of course take so much cognizance they have the powers to take so much cognizance of if they think that some manifest injustice has happened some gross act gro gross act of injustice has happened but i will go back to my original answer like i said there is a tendency especially amongst say young budding lawyers or even in the public in general who are not well acquainted with the nuances of the law the intricacies of how things happen there is a tendency that all justice will come from the court which is not correct because this power of remission again is something which strictly lies in the domain of the executive it is a power which has to be exercised first by the executive by exercising its wisdom and by taking into account all relevant facts and circumstances into account the jail report the opinion of the superintendent the opinion of the presiding judge everything has to be taken into account now like i said the court of course has the power to take suomoto cognizance but that power should be exercised sparingly the courts cannot encroach upon the power of the executive to do these things because of course the executive is best placed to take these decisions so ideally these matters should be left to the executive to the appropriate government and only like i said when they have been exercised incorrectly illegally or in violation of the provisions of the constitution then the courts should come into the picture yes sir and uh, what kind of precedents does this case set in the context, uh, context of rights of the accused so in tandem of this issue i have a question uh, about the statement that you made that the judgment rendered in this particular case does not prejudice the potential cases in the future so so you said that the conviction the remission policy can be decided based on the convicts behavior demonstrated post conviction also so do you think there are potential there are future the the chances exist in future where the convicts will be released only on the attribute of the good behavior demonstrated by them in the uh, in the in time of incarceration so see good behavior definitely is a very important factor on which cases of remission or sentence reduction turn because that is probably the only objective ground that you have once a person starts serving their sentence so the the, the behavior that they have shown while within the confines of the jail the prison that is a very important factor of course it is not the sole determinative factor it is not the sole determining factor because like i said initially a lot of other things also have to be considered <laughs> for example if the release of the convict if there's any kind of real apprehension that the release of the convict can pose threat any kind of threat to the victim if the victim is alive or to the victim's family in case the victim is not there so all of those things also have to be considered in some cases of course heinousness of the crime also has to be considered but the difference is that the heinousness of the crime can never be a ground sole ground to reject somebody's remission uh, application just because the crime is heinous it cannot be a ground or it should not be a ground for rejection other factors also have to be taken into account the conduct but don't you think uh, there should be this the factor should be considered that the gravity of the facts and circumstances should matter in this case or in any other case even if it is a bona fide case so don't you think the gravity of the facts and circumstances or the heinousness of the crime should matter yes the heinousness of the crime should definitely matter but when you say this you also have to keep in mind the object of criminal jurisprudence what what is our criminal jurisprudence based on our criminal jurisprudence is not based on the idea of avenging a victim the idea behind punishment or the theory of punishment in our law is not based on the idea of revenge it is on the idea of reformation because no citizen no person is like i said in the beginning is an outlier everybody deserves a chance of reintegration in view of like keeping in mind whatever they may have done so that is why 
an objective assessment is very very important has the government the government in question taken into account everything to prove or to believe beyond any reasonable doubt that such and such person is ready to get reintegrated have they done enough during the time of uh, serving the sentence to deserve a second chance so those things also become a very important factor especially in light of the fact that the object of criminal law object of penalizing someone is not to put them behind bars forever is not to keep them behind bars forever if the government has made up their mind that this person is fit or is now ready to get reintegrated ready to be given a second chance to start their life afresh then such person should get that chance in view of the larger principle of reformation and not revenge i agree sir thank you so much so concluding this session we extend our heartfelt gratitude to harshit sir for accepting our invitation and delivering such an informative and insightful session we trust that the audience found it uh, both interesting and knowledgeable as well so thank you once again sir for sharing your valuable insights and for really delivering the legal implications of this case and we eagerly anticipate the opportunity to host you again thank you so much thank you thank you mehika thank you everyone